I should start this presentation with, hello, my name's Kate. Um, I wouldn't be able to start a presentation in any other way. Um, I'd be quite happy for anybody to tweet who wants to tweet um, <coughs> during this talk. So don't, I won't think you're offending me if you get your phones out and do a bit of tweeting. Um, so this was me. Um, I'm 29 years old, happily married to my husband, Chris. Um, I'm in my third year of training to become a consultant in medicine for older people, which is my lifelong ambition. And Chris is working his way up the management ladder at ASDA. We're just thinking about starting a family, and I've actually even started taking my folic acid in preparation for that. And we thought we'd have a holiday. Um, we're very lucky that Chris's auntie and uncle live in Santa Cruz in California. Um, and Chrissy's grandma really wanted to meet her two new great-grandchildren. So we took her out there and um, decided that we'd have a nice break too. And as you can see, sat on Santa Cruz Pier, perfect weather, yeah, really enjoying a, a fantastic trip. You'd think my life was idyllic from that description, but for the one little niggling right-sided back pain that's starting to become a little bit troublesome, taking some painkillers and procrastinating it about it, as every doctor would when they develop a health problem. But the pain's getting worse and worse and worse. And eventually, Chris found me lying on, on the bed at his auntie and uncle's house in absolute agony. And he put his foot down in the, as a non-medic in the relationship and said it was time to get some help. So we ended up in an, an American emergency room where it became apparent very quickly that I was extremely unwell. Um, I had kidney failure, my creatinine was over 600, um, and, and I was in awful, awful pain that required like fentanyl to get me feeling better. <coughs> then I had some tests to work out why I had renal failure. And after a, an ultrasound and a CT scan, it became apparent that I had tumours everywhere right throughout my tummy, they were blocking my ureters and bang, out of the blue, at the age of 29, I got cancer. So I was patched up in the States, I popped some stents in my ureters to get my kidneys working again, um, and got my pain under control, um, and I came home to pursue further investigations and, and treatment with the NHS. Um, this is where I, I started my road as a journey as a patient in, in the, the NHS model of care. I was admitted very soon after my, um, my referral from my GP to a gynae um, assessment unit. <coughs> and they thought I might have ovarian cancer, but they weren't quite sure what was going on. So I had some tests and some investigations and some biopsies and things. Um, and it became apparent that I didn't really have a varying cancer, that there was something much rarer going on. So it took three weeks for them to work out what that was, in which time my stents failed, I ended up with bilateral nephrostomies and became very unwell with pyelonephritis. So after after all that time with the histopathologist scratching their heads, they worked out that I actually had a very rare type of sarcoma. It affects just one in two million people. It normally picks on young um, adolescent males, so why it was picking on an approaching middle-aged woman, I've no idea. But it did. It spread to my bones and my liver, so I was in a palliative, incurable situation. I had some big decisions to make about what I was going to do with my future. So, after a lot of thought and a lot of discussion with my family, we went down the road of palliative chemotherapy. The trouble with this cancer is that you can't just tickle it with a little tiny bit of chemotherapy because it just doesn't work. In about 40% of cases, the cancer doesn't respond to chemotherapy at all. So I was really throwing a dice to see what would happen. I went into hospital for very intensive inpatient chemotherapy um, and was extremely unwell. Kept having problems with infection and bleeding and, and obviously had nephrostomies and all the complications of those. 
I went through that for five cycles and then I made a big decision. We'd, um, it was New Year's Eve 2011 and Chris, Chris and I celebrated being together for 10 years that day. We did that in hospital. And after Chris had gone home that evening, um, I had a blood transfusion and I watched the fireworks going off over Leeds um, as midnight approached. And I made the decision that I'd really had enough of going in and out and in and out of hospital. And all I wanted was a bit of quality of life. The burdens of treatment were really outweighing the benefits. So I took the decision that I was going to stop my chemotherapy and go back to work, as mad as that sounds. Um, my oncologist had told me that I'd never work again and, and I was really determined to prove him wrong. So three weeks later, after jumping over the occupational health and deanery hoops, um, I was back at work doing what, what I love to do and always have loved to do, which is look after old people. So today, um, what I thought I'd talk about um, are my values as a patient. And, and as a healthcare professional and why those things matter to me and tell you some stories about when things have gone well and when things have gone not so well um, in, in the context of those values um, and then I'll move on and tell you about why essentially I'm here and hello my name is and what, what that's all about. So my, my first key value which I think has to be at the number one priority for everyone who looks after patients in any context is, is communication. And this is a word that's banded around, it's banded around our um, university courses, it's banded around our training schemes, and, and I'm sure it's the same for nurses. It's a very important word. But do we ever stop and really think about communication and what it means to a patient, what, it, what harm it can do when it's done badly, and how therapeutic in itself it can be when, when it's done well. So I just want you to try and put yourself in my position. Um, 29 years old, recently diagnosed with cancer, in hospital, I'm scared, in fact I'm petrified, um, I'm in pain and, and I just don't know what's happened, my whole world's crushed. And I've had an MRI scan um, and an SHO comes to talk to me about the results of that MRI scan. Um, I'm by myself in, in a side room. And he came into the room, sat down in the chair beside me, kind of looked out of the window and blurted out, I'm afraid your cancer's spread. <coughs> then he couldn't really leave the room quick enough. I never saw him again. And he didn't tell the nurses what he told me. So I was just left in this state of having just received my death sentence um, in a horrible state of psychological distress. And that was all because of the way the communication of that news was handled. You contrast that with when my oncologist told me that I, what the actual definitive diagnosis of my cancer was. He was so gentle he came to see me by himself, sat down beside me, held my hand and ju really gently broke it to me that we were dealing with the worst case scenario. And then he shut up. He must have been quiet for five minutes. Felt like forever. But that time gave me a chance to cry, a chance to collect my thoughts, a chance to compose myself and think of the questions that had become apparent in my mind which he then dealt with in a way that I could understand. Then left me and came back later in the day to make sure that I was, I was okay. Even though that news was probably more devastating than the first news, it was handled in such a better way that it was so much easier to hear from my perspective as a patient. So communication really matters and we have to think about everything that we tell our patients and how, how we tell them. I remember when I was first admitted to um, the gynaecology unit um, at St James's and 
I was, you know, relatively well at first before my stents failed again. Looking after myself, you know, the average patient on a ward that most nurses would like to look after because I didn't, you know, I didn't need all that much. But then I, I suddenly developed this really severe pain, which sort of <laughs> represented my stents failing. So anyone who's had renal stones in the room will know how severe renal colic kind of pain is. And I was rolling around the bed in agony, really, really so. And the staff nurse that came to see me basically refused to give me the Oromorph that was prescribed. She said, I'd just had my paracetamol and just wait and see if that worked. But I was the patient that never complained mm -hmm. and all of a sudden had 10 out of 10 pain. The Oromorph was prescribed. That was a difficult situation to handle and she didn't communicate well with me. She didn't listen to me on my problems or even see what, what was going on. The student nurse who was looking after me that day was really a great advocate for me because she went back to, this, back to the staff nurse and said, look, Kate's really in severe pain and I really think we should give her some more and more. Which happened and relieved my pain. Um, so communication is so vitally important and every contact we have with our <laughs> patients really, really matters. And that kind of nicely leads on to my second key value, which is about the little things. And the little things really do matter. They're the things that make a difference between a good experience and a bad experience as a patient. And they're the things you remember as a patient. So a couple of months ago, I was in hospital with a, an infection in my stents that drained my kidneys. <coughs> um, I've been quite unwell. And I, I suffer with really bad nighttime pelvic pain from all the cancer that's, that's in my pelvis. And normally, if I was at home, I'd just take my arm off, get my heat pack, um, maybe go and watch television. But you can't really do that in hospital, because I've got this fear of the big, big orange button. I don't like pressing it. <laughs> and I know a lot of patients are exactly the same. Um, but that night, the nurse who was looking after me noticed that I was awake. And she came in, she noticed that I was in pain without me really having to say. She got me some oxynorm without me having to ask. And she sorted me out a heat pack and she sat with me until my pain had resolved and I could get back to sleep. Those little things, they really do matter. And she made my experience so much better that evening. On the similar admission, I, um, I was, I'd got very, very poorly. And um, the consultant oncologist had to come and see me um, on a Saturday evening. So I was already feeling guilty about dragging him into the hospital. And there were lots of things he needed to do for me to change my care around, to speak to my surgeon, to speak to the microbiologists, um, to change my pain relief. But the one thing I remember about that, that evening was him putting his hand on my arm, knelt, kneeling down beside my bed, and just telling me, it's going to be all right, Kate, okay, we're going to look after you. In that one moment that took five seconds, I felt cared for. I felt that he'd recognised my vulnerability and my fear and responded to that. And that's what compassion is. My third key value that really matters to me is that I'm at the centre of my care. And that patient-centred, or as I like to call it, person-centred care, is really what we should all strive for in the NHS. So I'll tell you a story from yesterday. I'm not very well at the moment. Yesterday evening I, I spiked quite well. In the early hours of yesterday um, I spoke, spiked a fever and was, was quite unwell. And I went to hospital and um, went to our ambulatory oncology unit um, where the nurses who know me recognised that I wasn't very well and got our team um, registrar to see me. 
And he didn't want to let me go home on IV antibiotics because it's not what we do. What we do is admit patients and give them IV antibiotics in hospital um, because that's, that's what we do. And we can't think outside the box and maybe think that Kate's well trained in giving her own IV antibiotics and she's got a talk to give in Newcastle. <laughs> so actually, what she'd like to do is go home, give her own IV antibiotics um, and get on with her life because things don't stop just because I'm ill. Um, and I had to fight so hard with the advocacy of a fantastic senior sister on the ward um, to get what I needed. I was much comfier at home last night. I got my antibiotics on time. I measured, <laughs> I measured my observation um, and everything's going swimmingly well because I'm feeling much better. Um, but that was an example of how you can provide person-centered care if you just think a little bit outside the box. When people don't put me at the centre, that's when I get a bit upset and a bit aggravated. Um, I remember it, a, a few months ago I, I had some chemotherapy and, and I was in hospital after my chemotherapy and well with an infection. Um, and I've gone through the usual process of having my blood done and getting my tassis in and some fluids and a consultant review and then I'd been moved off to another ward. And at lunchtime the nurse came to give me my antibiotics and I said to her, is it tassis in o'clock? And she said to him, no I've got you some meropenem. And it's a bit like, well, why have I got meropenem? So the first thought that went through my mind was, wrong drug chart. I've come to this other ward with the wrong drug chart. It's fine. I'll get the other drug chart and it'll be, it'll be absolutely fine. It's just a mistake. The second thought that went through my mind was, oh my God, I've got a really serious infection and they've had to get the Domestos out. <laughs> Unfortunately, the latter was the, the actual situation. And looking back at my medical notes, what had happened was the consultant had seen me and then he'd very diligently gone through all the microbiology results on the server and found that I'd grown a multi-resistant E. coli in my urine a couple of weeks before, which I had no knowledge of. So he'd asked the junior doctor to speak to the microbiologist um, and she'd done that, documented it beautifully, written up the right antibiotics and I'd got the right antibiotics. And that's fine, it's safe care. But he'd forgotten one thing, and that one thing was me. I had no knowledge of that pathway of care because nobody had spoken to me. And that really matters to me. I need to be involved in my care. I need to have some aspect of control. If you could write in big letters across my medical notes, Kate wants to know everything, then perhaps that might help. <laughs> but we do things to our patients and we don't tell them. We order scans and we don't tell them. I remember having an MRI right at the beginning of my experience and nobody told me. The first thing I knew was a porter turning up with a wheelchair. If we don't think about our patients, then as, as what's, what's happening to them, then it's very easy for us to get lost in systems and processes. When I started out in medicine, I worked for a very wise clinician called Dr. Kemp and he took me under his wing because he knew I wanted to be a physician as well. And he used to say to me, Kate, being a good, good clinician is about painting a picture, <coughs> not about following all these protocols and, and ticking boxes. It's about painting a picture and each day you'll add a little bit more and then you'll come up with a masterpiece. And I guess that's what William Ursel was saying as well when he said the good physician treats the disease but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And that neatly leads me on to my final key value which is about seeing me and not just my <coughs> disease. I've been referred to within earshot by a consultant as that girl with DSRCT. So within one sentence I've been reduced to just a rare cancer and nothing else. 
but in reality there's a whole lot more to my life there's all my family life as a wife as an auntie to three nephews and a newborn niece there's my career as a doctor there's my love of baking my love of music and my flute my my passion for the theater my passion for reading there's a whole lot of things about me that i've put a lot further forward rather than rather than just my cancer but i think finding these things out about our patients actually makes the care that we provide better and more accurate so a couple of months ago i looked after an older older chap who'd come into hospital with a pneumonia he was in his 90s um, and he was sick as a dog, really, really poorly. And it, he was in the emergency department and the, um, the ITU team had already been to see him and said, oh no, he's not for us. Um, and the A&E team had sort of said, oh yeah, we'll just give him some antibiotics and, and admit him to elderly. So I, I went to see him and I sat down with his family and had a chat. And I would start these chats with, tell me about your dad or your husband or your wife or whoever. And I found out that this chap had rode a bicycle in the Olympics and had walked up a mountain the week before and was actually really, really, really fit. Um, so we went back to the ITU team and said, actually, do you think you really should think about ITU as a, as a possible um, treatment option? And he went off to ITU. He was intubated in the end. Um, and needed needed inotropes and things to get his blood pressure up but seven days later he came off ITU and seven days after that he went home so knowing these things about what makes us people rather than just patients can actually change the care that we deliver anybody who follows me on Twitter will know that I normally use all my 140 characters when I, when I tweet so when I send short tweets, it means I'm angry. <laughs> so I sent this tweet in August last year. Um, I was in hospital um, and I was getting increasingly frustrated by my um, numeric status rather than not having a, a name. It had become so much so that the housekeepers used to ask the bed numbers if they wanted a drink. So it was bed number seven would you like a cup of tea <laughs> I was getting quite frustrated by this and you could hear within earshot of everyone saying oh bed seven needs some antibiotics and bed seven needs that and I, I just became so frustrated by it because hospital is a dehumanizing place even if you have the best care experience the most compassionate nurses um, the best doctors it is a dehumanizing place because you take away people's independence so you take away people's ability to self-medicate you take away when you can have a drink when you eat when you go to sleep all these things are regulated for you um, but not to even to even not have your name really does um, make an experience even more dehumanizing than it than it needs to be <coughs> This is a hospital selfie. I was um, bald from chemo, but my hair's back now. Um, and I'm feeling a bit poorly, um, but I'm feeling sleep deprived um, primarily. And that's because I've been in hospital for three days and I've been through that cycle of being woken up at two o'clock to have your ops done and being woken up at four o'clock to have your IV fluids changed and I've been woken up at six o'clock to have your ops done again and have your IV antibiotics and then being woken up at eight o'clock for breakfast and then nine o'clock to change your bed, etc. And this cycle goes on and on and on. And it got to the third day and I was getting really grumpy because when I don't get sleep, I get grumpy. And a cleaner, the nurse had left me to um, get some rest. And a cleaner came into my room and literally shouted at me until I woke up asking me if it was alright to clean my room. At that point I pulled a sheet over my head and just wanted the world to go away. Um, 
I self-discharged from hospital that evening, probably, um, well, against medical advice, but I just needed to get home. I slept for 16 hours and felt much better for it. But it got me thinking, the whole experience, do we actually run our wards for the benefit of our patients, or do we run them for the convenience of our staff? I don't know. Obviously, some things need to happen on a, on a hospital ward, but do we ever think about how we can make it a little bit nicer for patients? These are my stents. I think everyone can see the lines around my tummy. Um, they're very important to me. Um, because without them I'd have to live with bilateral nephrostomies and that would mean no work, no talking, um, no, no independent life really. Um, but they have to be replaced every six months um, and that has to be done by an operation. So in August last year I went into hospital to have them replaced. Everything went really smoothly. I have a fantastic urologist who, who is really good. Um, and I was out of hospital, bang on the fourth four set of observations. I was dressed and ready to go. <laughs> went home and everything was fine. Unfortunately, 36 hours later, I spiked a fever um, <coughs> and was rigoring and feeling really quite poorly. So I ended up back in the emergency department with post-operative sepsis. And this became apparent that I was really unwell and um, I needed to come back into hospital. 